Hi everybody, I'm Beth Lynn Eicher of Architect Research and I'll be talking to you about uh, some of the, the roots of high performance computing and a little bit about war games and what high performance computing looks like today, especially the security thereof. We remember the, the movie War Games where several <laughs> several blunders were uh, occurred to permit a teenager to log into a supercomputer and start World War III. While um, there is no real, real whopper out there, there uh, are dozens of classified systems within the uh, realm of high performance computing that are out there and it is in our best national interest and interest of you know being human beings to protect this very sensitive data and to that goal I have developed something called the High Performance Computing Evaluating Plan. But first, let's go back to the roots of what high performance computing and we have to go, of course, to, to Grace Murray Hopper who did some pretty bold things in her tenure at a company called Remington Rand. A lot of people think that she invented a compiler within her military service, but it was actually, in fact, during a time between World War II and her re-entry to the Navy that she had invented the compiler. Everybody told her that it was simply darn impossible to create human instruction that would be readable by an interpreter and then put into machine language and then put in to um, actual ones and zeros. There are a lot of things that we are still discovering about Grace Murray Hopper. I'll show anybody who's interested after this presentation. But this is the um, best, sharpest image that I can find of Grace Murray Hopper within the Remington Rand era. During the time, um, it was um, circa 1961. She smoked. A lot of other folks in business smoked. And here she is holding a cigarette. This image has been fuzzed out and cropped out of that cigarette for all of these years. There's even her in this very image, but cropped out on a cover of a book about her. And even though I am anti-tobacco, I'm like, wow, she smoked. Everybody hid that from us. And perhaps she's just that much of a badass that it, she did whatever everyone else in business it did back then and it didn't matter that um, she was a woman or that everybody told her that she couldn't do it. Gosh darn it, if she wanted to um, have a picture of herself published in a newspaper like this in New York. And um, that, that's what she wanted then Gosh darn it, we should honor that and show her for um, who she was. 
I thank all the rest of you who come and gather at Vintage Midwest to celebrate exactly the, the, these types of roots and also um, not covering up or cropping out or, expo or lacking to expose the, the true history of computer science. So thank you. This is a picture of me with Grace's machine. It's Mark I at um, Harvard. Unfortunately, Harvard is over um, doing their, their lobby right now, and they have this whole display covered up and you notice there that there's these little pictures of how the machine was constructed and all that stuff. Not a single picture of my girl Grace. How, how can that be? It's because of all of that cropping over the years that perhaps we, we just um, did not quite think this through. So that's when I decided, you know what? If Grace Murray Hopper could be the director of research at Remington Rand and starting out on her own with uh, a company that formerly made razors, I could very well be a part of a very small company here in Chicago, Illinois, called Architect Corporation, be a director of research, and in turn provide highly excellent services for those who are operating modern day high performance computing systems. Well, this is Grace's machine. This is me with one of my machines. Meet Bridges. Bridges is the um, Exceed Project National Science Foundation funded system from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I had the honor and privilege to work at Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center to evaluate their new cluster and to see how they were operating, both for um, a user's perspective and from the security perspective. And it got me into thinking, a lot of folks in high performance computing had chosen this career and actually typically stay in the same site for their entire career. They get into this whole rut of doing things the same way, and that's exactly against what um, Grace Murray Hopper always taught us, that you don't do things just because you've always done that that way. And then that made me to think, well, let, let's examine the genesis, or at least the fictional genesis, of what how have we always done things within high performance computing cybersecurity? And that brought me to War Games, <laughs> a 35 year old movie where there were serious blunders committed upon a supercomputer called the Whopper, owned by NORAD. And its true task was to do an endless series of war games. What if the Russians dropped the ball first? How would we react? Vice versa, vice versa. A Cold War thriller for the ages. Starring Mar Matthew Broderick, he cracks into a dead scientist's identity, or presumed dead scientist. 
they had presumed that if a um, software developer who had made highly sensitive software codes, such as the war game itself, were, were to just disappear to his own island, then we wouldn't have to worry about understanding what this code actually does. And we can continue to let this code run and operate on our supercomputer. And nah, he wouldn't have put a back door in there, would he have? <laughs> well, we all know in this room that um, the way that one would access uh, such large systems or mainframes was to dial in and it was due to the random sequence of numbers that Matthew Broderick did dial in. It was in a goal to stumble upon the real number of a video game developer that he was hoping would produce a really awesome game. And maybe it's called Thermal Nuclear Warfare. Why not? That sounds fun. Let's go play it. Would you rather play chess? Nah, let's do this. Well, um, because he was trying to show off with um, his girlfriend in the bedroom right behind him. He'd um, log into the system and it asked him who he was to authenticate. His girlfriend says, how rude. This system did not introduce itself to you. How could it say, well, who are you? Well, you know what? That was actually the genesis of a rule that is in the National Institutes of Standards and Technology 853A, Access Control Number 8. You must identify yourself. So, you know, if you just so happen to be surfing around and just so happen to accidentally shell into a system that says, Warning, you are about to log into a federal government system. The stuff is classified. Do not proceed or your actions are being logged. Those types of disclaimers came from the very point of how rude. How would somebody know as to whether or not they were logging <clears throat> in to their favorite video game development site? Or might they be logging in to a classified DOD supercomputer? Now, as Matthew Broderick was scanning through the area codes and then the neighborhood codes to stumble upon their favorite video game development site, one could say, oh no, that, that would never happen today because we don't do dial-in anymore for any of these systems. No, nobody has modem banks. Well, maybe they don't have modem banks, but you still have to worry about the, the access if you have a public IP address. And, you know, the owners of the Class A and the Class B networks are publicly known, you could go ahead and port scan into a system that you do not have access to proceed in. But, you know, um, that, that brings us to the, the whole social engineering aspect of his exploit. Matthew Broderick went to the library and he 
discovered, oh, this code was written by this scientist because it has his name all over it. I want to find out what about him? What sort of work says he published? And that's why he found out some other news about this particular scientist's family and he had a password. What was his password? Something. Joshua. 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 Joshua was his password. So, you know, you, you still to this day and age, you, you be careful about what you release to the press and to social media about uh, your personal life especially if you're going to embed very personal things about yourself into your passwords. And, you know, um, apps with a backdoor, yeah, that can and does happen in 2018. It is less likely to happen if you use free and open source software where the, the code would have the 10 million eyeballs as described in the Cathedral Bazaar. However, um, if you choose to keep your code proprietary strictly in-house, this is completely classified and, well, you know, you better have more than one person who can read it and understand it especially as these people retire. This particular scientist, in fact, did not pass away as per the movie. He went crazy and decided that he'd rather fake his own death and be on a very private island before um, he would ever touch the Whopper computer or its code ever again. But why didn't he shut it down? Why not? Bringing it back to um, current systems, there is a way for you to see in modern day high performance commuting systems as to what other applications other people are running on the system. And once you know the name of the application, you might be able to find out the full path of the application and therefore execute it yourself. Even the name of your software might be classified within the scheme of um, heavily classified work. If you happen to, you know, work for a three-letter agency like the DOD or even the DOE. You might not want to run that job if you happen to see a colleague run a piece of software called Global Nuclear Warfare. <laughs> you know, that, that's not one that you want to me too about, but that's exactly what had happened in that movie, yet yeah, it is still possible to this day to transparently not only see the applications that are running in um, your, your list of applications that are currently executing, but also who is running them within a highly distributed system. What do I mean by highly distributed system? Now, Whopper, for as many blinky lights as it had, we just thought of it as just one big box. And they never even discussed where the, the modem bank was that it, it accessed. But you know, um, it, one would think that there would was something more to it than than just the the big black box that this was 
a big old ecosystem. Uh, today's modern day supercomputers are certainly a huge ecosystem. Let me show you one. So, say you want to get to a supercomputer. People think, well, we, we want to access, of course, the, the compute nodes where you could run your applications at incredibly high speed. In the good old days, it was about people who wanted to get in to be a big deal trophy. Or, ha ha ha, look what I broke into. Um, of course, with um, the, the movie, it made us think, well, geez, is Matthew Broderick's character a communist? Does or could a 15-year-old kid commit um, a corrosion or some other sort of threat against high performance computing. You know what he said whenever he had demonstrated to his girlfriend that yes, he could hack into a system. Yes, it was indeed his high school system, and no, I don't think I deserved an F. I think I deserved an A. It's, yeah, sure, it's against the law, but, you know, you're not going to prosecute. I'm under 18. Nobody's going to believe that a teenager could pull off something so sophisticated as an exploit, but... Perhaps we're, we're just never going to, to give our, our youth the proper credit. I hear these kids today aren't the, the trophy seekers or even the espionage seekers. Do, does anybody want to take a guess as to what um, kids might be after nowadays? to crack in a supercomputer, or really anybody. Well, what's the, the hot thing? What's the new goal, the new objective? Use it to mine Bitcoin. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. The mining cryptocurrency, either you are a legit user who has logged in and then has utilized these types of systems, for a purpose that is not necessarily uh, the one that you had applied for a grant to use this supercomputer, or maybe you are password sharing with somebody who is a legit user and they have no idea as to your true activities. Well, if you are password sharing, you know, um, two-factor authentication or at least a VPN might do a little bit to, to help with that. But I, I'm seeing a lot of supercomputing sites that, that do not go to that, that first real obvious step. They, they look at the, the end game of cryptocurrency what are we doing about that threat? Rather than who cares why they're getting in, let's look at how they're getting in. I've asked this question in previous um, presentations of this nature, and I've been um, pleasantly surprised. Who you here has ever logged into a supercomputer? You have? Yeah. Tell us about it. I did the University of Chicago. I asked him for an account and he gave me one, so. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, at the, the UFC. I've never been a student there. I just asked him for an account and they gave me one. 
And was, it, was this a current error, error or another vintage? Um, it's, a, it's a little older, but okay. it's, like, it's like maybe, well, now it's probably about 10 years old now. About 10 years ago? Okay. Well, um, I'm not going to, to dare you to do so, but you know, that these are the types of reasons why we may want to, you know, audit our, our user list. You know, um, the, these types of things are detailed in the National Institute of Standards and Technology 800 53A, which is specifically for people who build systems that were funded with federal government dollars, and you betcha the University of Chicago was operating a system that was funded with federal government dollars, and I happen to know, just because I know people at the University of Chicago, that they, they have actually gone uh, through these check checklists and they have made appropriate decisions about <laughs> your your 10 year old account so <laughs> best not even try yeah, i probably don't have it anymore but i had it for mm -hmm. several years yep 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 but you know you, you take a look at it as a, um a total ecosystem how how are you connecting to the system? Are you terminaling in with um, usually an SSH? But you know, not necessarily nowadays. There are browser-based ways that certain supercomputers have been connected online. My favorite example is on the demand from Ohio Supercomputing Center, where they have a web browser. No software needs to be installed on your system. You go into the browser and then you can get a shell. Simple as that. There are also graphical applications that are using, I don't know, those extremely high powered GPUs that tend to be involved with supercomputers nowadays. And those um, applications do need to be looked at to see how they're, the security thereof, especially when it comes to the connection conversation. But that's only part of it. How do the files get in and how do the files get out? If you're doing um, very important science, like, I don't know, saving can uh, kids who have cancer or other missions of humanity, you're going to probably bring in data from an institution and then take it out as you publish. These types of questions need to be uh, decided within the system architecture as to how you're going to, to permit your user base to do this. These are some pretty sophisticated questions that my girl Grace Murray Hopper didn't necessarily have because there were about a dozen systems back in the 1960s that would have this type, uh, the type of power that one might be able to do in her vintage real science. But now, every darn university, whether they be the University of Chicago or a small little liberal arts school, can have the means to build an environment like this, perhaps modest in its um, ability to do much power, 
but perhaps more importantly might be the data, the bits, the real research that is the stuff that will get humanity to um, the next big thing. But what if the research is what I call data at rest? There were a lot of great things that have unfolded in the matter of science and technology. However, uh, they get published very obscurely or perhaps um, not at all. They, they get shelved and sometimes they get shelved within supercomputing centers. Being the stewards of that sort of data is very important just in case anybody comes back and looks for it, it might actually be a problem as difficult and old as librarianship. And that got me into thinking, well, geez, this is exactly why I studied information science whenever I was in school rather than computer science. Computers are just the tools of today. How, what we, we do with the wealth of information that we have, what the research that we can extract from our systems, whether they be super or not, is what is going to be profoundly important to not only our, our businesses, but our, our lives as humanity. So that's why I came up with a solution called High Performance Computing Evaluate and Plan. I walk through the 853A, which is the security controls catalog assessment procedures basically written for federal government systems, but it could be good enough for you. I use Red Hat's Open SCAP and other Red Hat tools to actually do the enforcement once your site has finally decided on a policy and procedure. I also recommend you to take a look at your SSH gateway, also known in the field as a bastion host, which will look at the access controls, such as who is logging in and what is the status of their accounts with multi-site collaborations, or perhaps the scientific computing might be sent different from central computing in sites. How do you synchronize these authentication and authorization decisions to make sure that they are policy-wide up to the very second? Well, I recommend a tool called Red Hat Identity Management if anyone here happens to be an IT director and would like to learn more about identity management, I would like to have a conversation with you after this presentation. So there you have it. High performance computing evaluate and plan. I'll, I can get into more of the, the software tools later for anybody who's interested regarding how you handle policies of enforcement for such a very complex architecture rather than that big old box that we thought of when we think of systems like the good old Whopper. Thank you very much.
I work as a consultant and architect collaboration and what we do is technology solutions. If there's anything that I can help you out with outside of even high performance computing, please let me know. I'd be happy to have a conversation with you. Does anyone have any questions? Well, this was delightful. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and show the version of Grace Mary Hopper and all of her, her glory because it, it's a shame. It's a shame that this high resolution image is gone, cropped, and whatnot for these many years. Now, who here is a library geek? Anybody? Now, this was in the Library of Congress. And the only way to get it at this particular resolution, in which it was kind of um, stolen by a site called sharp.com, I thank you, them for doing that. <laughs> They're, um, but what they're doing is a little bit dubious because nobody knows who has the copyright to this. Photography copyright is so, so, so darn difficult. Now, it is basically, and I'm going to simplify it to the point that I might almost get it wrong, but it by default is the copyright of the photographer. Right. However, this was published in a newspaper that is now defunct. And just because it was published in a defunct newspaper, it was archived in the Library of Congress. Right. However, who knows as to whether or not the person who took this photo circa 1961, we can presume just by the published date of the newspaper as to when the photograph was taken. It might have been prior to that. We don't know. But at what point do we say that yes, the photographer is most certainly has passed and none of his or her errors have um, been able to step forward and like, but wait, 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 wait a second. At what point are we letting our national treasures, and at least rightfully so, the Library of Congress has categorized this as a notable person and, and put it out there as such. But you do not get this kind of resolution from their thumbnails. What you get instead is a blurry mess which obscures the fact that she was smoking a cigarette. And very proudly so, smoking a cigarette. There she is. Well, they, they had, and they committed them to the Library of Congress, who has since categorized it and found her as a notable person and therefore it subjected it as that. However, it is completely unknown as to who the photographer was. Mm -hmm. And the, because the newspaper is now long defunct, 
that they had failed in the 1965, I had heard. Yeah, sure. Are there newspaper articles on Michael's speech or anything or somewhere? Because yes. the original article yes. might be a credit for that. Yes, I, I, have, I have considered doing that. I have considered doing that. But what it will take is it will re requesting the real. And because we live in Chicago, I live in Chicago anyhow. I do not have local access to this obscure New York newspaper, which is now defunct on my group fish. I would have to petition, again, the Library of Congress for that reel, which is usually sorted by, by year. So here I would be churning through the, all the articles within a, an entire year's time of publication. It was a publication that was seven days a week to um, see what, um, where this headshot and what was the, the subject matter of the article. I'm absolutely so fascinated. Like yes, <laughs> yes. You know what? Um, Uh, not everything. Not everything, not yet. And it's going to take a long time. And it's going to take a long time to, to look at these things. So you, you know about um, reCAPTCHA, right? You know about reCAPTCHA. So reCAPTCHA is an innovation that was invented out of Carnegie Mellon School of Computer Science by uh, the same person who's now the CEO of Duolingo. You know the, the apps that will teach you about a dozen different languages? Yeah, same guy. He focused it on human computation that you are basically being uh, tricked into being the supercomputer that solves the world's problems. Which makes me think, well, what if the world is the, the ultimate supercomputer? Now tell me, folks, tell me. I'm in the room of geeks, and what novel was it proposed that the Earth itself was a supercomputer that was very, very, very diligently working on the very, yes, Hitchhiker's Guide in the Galaxy. Now, what was the question that I was computing? Meaning of everything, and what was the answer? 42. 42. 42. Well, the, 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 the question wasn't parsed right, so we got That's the answer of 42. Too. He was he studying computer science at the time when he developed that whole concept of 42. Yeah. It goes deeper than just the answer in the book. So tell us about it. Well, uh, what was the, an, uh, the deal I about I, 42? I can't remember the exact specifics on it, but he was utilizing that in computer science. It was a conundrum he was working on already. And he integrated that within his book, which is also the answer to another conundrum within the book. But it actually goes deeper than, I can't remember the specifics, but I've read it in the past, that it was actually more than just a random number. It was actually a, a process that he was researching prior to in, including that within the Checkers Guide to the Fantastic. So there are... Yes, Yes, exactly. exactly. always could admission by mice. That's it. And only the dolphins were where to right, it all. Right. I'm not about ready to s sit up here and say mm -hmm. so long and thanks for all the fish, mm -hmm. but the, this is the official close to my presentation. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>